Hey, this is Joe Crane, host of Veteran on the Move podcast. And when I'm not helping veterans transition to entrepreneurship, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and how about sun, beaches, and a drink with an umbrella? Sound good? Well, today, we're talking about retiring outside the USA. So if you want a retirement happy ending, we've got you covered. Some experts join us. So first, his new book is called The Fun Side of the Wall and covers why baby boomers retire in droves to Mexico. Say hello to Travis Luther. And a woman who's originally from France and lived in Guatemala from the blog Reach Financial Independence, it's Pauline Paquin. And rounding out our panel, he retired from corporate life at 43 and moved to Panama with his wife and daughter. He's the guy behind the popular Route to Retire blog, Say Hello to Jim White. Plus, worried about your kids not understanding money? On today's Friday FinTech segment, we'll share a solution called Jaspi and learn about it from founder Benny Natchman. Later, we'll magnify Jake's money. He's a high school business teacher and wants to gift his students some stock. What's the easiest way to do this? And, of course, I'll keep you coming back for more with my trivia. And now, a guy who tried to retire to another country, but they just shipped him right back to the U.S. of A., it's Joe Salcihai. Entirely not true, but if I could have retired to Bavaria, I totally, totally would have. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Retire Abroad for the Win podcast. I'm Joe Salci. Hi, Average Show Money on Twitter. And we have a very special panel for you today. As you heard Doug say earlier, no Len, no Paula, no OG. Instead, we've got a whole different cast of characters. So let's introduce them to you. We're going to start off in, I believe, in San Diego, where she's hanging out at a Marine base. Our friend Paula Paquin from Reach Financial Independence is back. How are you? Did I lose you? And she's gone. <laughs> Hi, I'm not. Hi, Joe. Thank you so much for having me. There, How are there, you doing? Good, but you're on a Marine. Are you keeping the Marines in line, Pauline? Is that what's going on? I am actually giving them financial advice. <laughs> nice. And I am volunteering at a relief society. So we do budget counseling and help them transition to civilian life and stuff like that. And yeah, that's been very interesting. That's fabulous. Tell us about why you decided to go to Guatemala. It's just kind of happened. I left France right after business school and I just wanted to travel the world. Ended up in about 30 countries and got a job offer in Guatemala to stay a little bit longer in a nice hotel. I said, sure, why not? Let's do that. Let's see a little more of the world for a little bit longer. It happened to be a decent salary and a decent working condition. So not your typical, oh, I'm just going to backpack and bartend on the way and hope to make it to the next town kind of job. So I then ended up in a law firm in Guatemala City and spent about three years there total. And eventually came back to start a little guest house and have my own business there. And uh, that's when the blog was created, I think, right? Yes. I was also, I was doing a bit of travel blogging and kind of got burnt out talking about my travels and interrupting my travels to take a picture for the blog or jot down something for the blog. I just wanted to see the world on my own terms and thought, hey, let's talk money and how money buys freedom and choices and how All the people who may not have that dream of going around the world like crazies, but just, you know, staying at home with their kids or going back to college or taking a lower paying job they love. How could they do that? And how could they achieve their financial goals? 
some of the uh, barriers you ran into when you were there, I, I loved reading about at the time. I didn't, I really felt for you sometimes, Pauline, some of the things and we'll <laughs> talk about those later, but I'm so glad you could be with us today to talk a little bit about <clears throat> going elsewhere. Also, a gentleman who I believe uh, started off researching this stuff. He's in Denver and talks in his uh, hot new book, The Fun Side of the Wall, about baby boomers retiring in Mexico. Travis Luther's here. How are you, man? I'm awesome, Joe. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm glad you could join us. But how did this project start where you decided to look at the fun side of the wall, as you call it? <laughs> well, I, I will admit it was a total accident. I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. And in 2008, I was in graduate school for sociology at the University of Colorado, Denver. And I had picked up Tim Ferriss's book, The 4-Hour Workweek, which had just come out. And I read that. And then at an airport, I read uh, Thomas Friedman's The World is Flat. And I had kind of this epiphany that, you know, I had grown up in rural Washington uh, on the border of Washington State and Idaho. And I hadn't really thought much of the world outside of the United States. In fact, as I say in my book, I you know, kind of naively thought the world outside the United States was dangerous, dumb and stupid, as I said. And, you know, having read these books and being an entrepreneur myself, I thought, gosh, I, you know, maybe I've maybe I've been kind of naive. So um, using those books and the websites that were in there, I started to reach out to entrepreneurs who were in India and Panama and Costa Rica. And I came to discover what we call now digital nomads, you know, entrepreneurs who are also from the United States who are traveling around the world and taking advantage of the cost savings to run their businesses from other places. So this kind of coincided with my having to make a decision about what my thesis was going to be on. And so I went to my advisor and I said, I think I've got something I'm really interested in. I want to study expats who have left the United States. And I want to come to understand why would anybody leave what I had come to believe was the greatest country in the world? She said, you'll never get out of graduate school. If you survey every expat who's ever lost, left the United States, you've really got to narrow it down to a specific place, <laughs> to a specific demographic. And so I came across an enclave of expats in Mexico and uh, realized that most of those, in fact, were baby boomers. And so you know, again, just kind of happy accident. I narrowed down my focus and then dug into the research and really had no idea that it would end up, you know, being a, a 10 year project and result in a book and, and everything that's come since. But that's basically the evolution of my story and, and my discovery of these uh, enclaves in Mexico. It kind of looks like this whole discussion, Travis, didn't take you where you thought it was going to take you though. No, you know, I mean, you know, anyone who's gone to graduate school knows you got to form a hypothesis. And mine was basically that, you know, people who could not afford to live in the United States, or I'm sorry, people who could not afford to retire in the United States would choose Mexico because they had no other option and because they had no money. And uh, I actually found quite the opposite of that to be true. And the people that chose to move to Mexico were actually some of the more affluent baby boomers in the United States, as well as some of the most educated. I want to ask you one more question. Just in the description of your book, there's a line that grabbed me when I first saw the book. And so I opened it up before we got on the call today because I couldn't remember the exact words. And it is, your book is a critique of the way retirement's been commodified in the United States. And I remember that hit me like a ton of bricks at the time. What do you mean by that? What I mean is, for most of us, we see retirement as a place where we exit work and then we go into some kind of structured living that's largely dictated by these corporations or these retirement centers um, where there's these really rigid schedules and there's these this kind of limited scope of opportunities and you kind of live in this Soviet style block living where everything's kind of the same and every 54 people share a, a treadmill and a pool and the people that had chose to go to Mexico really wanted to have more freedom to dictate the terms of their retirement. And what they were especially concerned with is having support, but also preserving their autonomy. So they wanted to live in a place where they had these relationships of reciprocity, as I call them, where they could help others out and be helped out to an equal extent while still having the freedom to do what they wanted to do with their retirement. And, and for a lot of them, that meant continuing on education projects or doing community service projects, you know, that weren't dictated by anyone but themselves, entering social clubs and activities. Um, and again, like I said, largely living on their own, though, in a community that was still supportive. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating because not at all what you think about when you think about people retiring to Mexico. 
In right. fact, exactly the opposite. And a guy who is doing the opposite of what a lot of people do at age 43, he decides he's going to go to Panama with his <laughs> wife and daughter from root to retire. Jim White's finally on the show. It's about time we got you here, my friend. Yeah, I appreciate you having me, Joe. Well, tell everybody you're not 43 yet. You're maybe 41 or 42, let's say, and you're thinking about moving. When did Panama enter the discussion? When my daughter was born in 2010, that was kind of the, the big eye opener for me. When I had to go back to work and couldn't be with her every day, I was like, well, wait a minute, this isn't right. I, I, I want to be spending my time with her. So it was at that point I started looking for some options. And then I ended up coming across uh, the fire movement. I came across Joe Udo's blog, Retire by 40. That kind of got me on track to go, hey, there's other options. This guy, he's just like me. I mean, this is a possibility to actually retire early and not be Elon Musk or uh, a baller like that. And so that was the. Uh, oh, you're still a baller, though, opener. Jim. You're still a baller, though, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> not not as much as you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But it's funny. So that would make your daughter 10 or 11 now. And, you know, most people, and I'm sure in, in Travis's work, he's looked at this too. I, I would imagine people wait till kids 18 to do anything, right? Got to get the kid out of the house first, Jim. Then we can go. Why did you decide to go then right at uh, 43? I'm, uh, I'm too much of a softy. I wanted to spend as much time as I could with her. So, yeah. So I looked at trying to find a way that I could leave work early and just be able to spend the time with her. So that's when financial independence became the way to do it. And it wasn't about having more money than I could possibly spend. It was about having enough money that we could live our normal lifestyle without needing to, to worry about working again. It's not to say we'll never work again, but it's it's buying us the time that we don't have to if we don't need to, if we don't want to. Well, I'm so excited you're here with us. We got Jim here. We've got Travis here. We've got Pauline here. We're going to talk about retiring abroad, the good, the bad, the ugly. So let's roll into our discussion of retiring abroad. <laughs> Different than most of our roundtables where we focus on a major media piece, this time I just want to pick all three of your brains about the why, the how, Travis from your research, and, and then Pauline and Jim from your personal experiences. And I think, Jim, because you went last in our introductions, I'm going to go to you first. What was attractive Yay. specifically about Panama and why Panama versus other countries like Travis, you know, looked at Mexico, Pauline was in Guatemala. Did you look at all these things and I'm imagining a nerdy spreadsheet or did you just say Panama <laughs> or bust? <laughs> no, I, I'm definitely a research guy and a spreadsheet guy, but there, there were no spreadsheets uh, for this until later. But it actually started out where we were looking at just finding a place where our net worth would last a little bit longer. So that initially started in the U.S., looking for a lower cost of living place in the U.S. And then I said, well, wait a minute, we're, we're going to be retired. Why don't we look at other options? Why not look at different countries? And so I started digging around into different countries. And, and there's obviously going to be pros and cons to wherever you go in the world. For us, though, we needed kind of a, a smaller step than some people would be more comfortable with. And overall, Panama became that answer because, you know, they use the U.S. dollar here. You know, the expat communities, they're, they speak English. They, you know, they have good health care. They have everything lined up. It's close to uh, close enough to home compared to, you know, maybe Thailand or something like that. And so this just seemed to be a place that matched what we were looking for. So to some degree, it sounds like there was also this ease because you didn't have to calculate currency. You didn't have to negotiate a different language. Right. When we go to the ATM, it spits out $20 bills. And I'm pretty happy about that. We're, <laughs> we're stacking Benjamins at the ATMs. Nice. But, uh, 20 at a time. <laughs> it, it's definitely much easier. And that's not to say there aren't a lot of differences. I mean, obviously, the Panamanians here are speaking Spanish and we're learning that and everything. But it's it's still an easier step than a lot of places would be. Pauline, you, you explained earlier that you were organically in Guatemala for a job um, before going off on your own. Did you ever consider, though, other countries or was it going to be Guatemala because you were already there? 
I did. I actually, Guatemala, so after that round the world trip, was the first country I landed a job in. But mm. I applied for things in Mexico, in Argentina, thinking, you know, big countries, big population, there's got to be a job for me there. Sadly, big country also means bigger regulations, and it was way more complicated. And Guatemala was, oh, you can start working on a tourist visa legally if the company sponsors you. You know, from day one, you, you're you still on your tourist visa, but you're good to go to work, get your salary, and then in six months' time, you get your residency. One thing I did not want to do is work under the table or, you know, do anything that would go against the country that was receiving me. So that worked out. And after a couple of years, I thought, oh, it would be nice to be a little bit closer to family. So I moved to Barcelona and I started a business there, which as a European uh, with a Schengen passport was super easy to do. So I, I didn't have to ask anyone permission to do that. I miserably failed during the 2008 financial crisis. So the business went down and I moved on to the UK thinking um, bigger salaries in the UK. I, I can tolerate the weather for a little while and fill back the coffers. So I moved there. And once the coffers were full, I moved to Morocco thinking, like you guys, you know, similar time zone, Panama, Mexico, that's easy, that's close to home. Morocco, they speak French, uh, it's very familiar. And that would be perfect, except I was living in a very expat bubble and I did not want that. I wanted to live a local life. Why and, did you, why did you uh, not to interrupt, but why? Why not live in an expat bubble? Because I, I simply didn't see the point. Why am I going to be in an in another country, like in Morocco, I would uh, get together with French friends to drink wine and eat ham because it's forbidden by the Muslim religion. So you cannot go out to a restaurant and do that. And every time someone would fly back to France, they would come back with that, you know, liquid gold. And we would all <laughs> sip it it's like, oh, my God, we miss friends so much. And that's not the goal. You're you're not in another country to live like you would back home. So that started to bother me, but they were my, my social circle. And my Arabic was not good enough to just go have a conversation like we're having uh, with my English. So I, I could not really hang with the Moroccans. I didn't really like hanging with the French. And in Guatemala, I was speaking Spanish and getting along with locals and having local friends. Did you have and did, also local friends don't leave. Did, Just when you're an expat <laughs> you you go to goodbye parties all the time. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's somebody else going. Did you have trouble speaking Spanish at all? Or is your Spanish good enough that it was fairly easy? Yeah, it's like my English, if not better. So I I didn't have any trouble and that was the ease of acclimating to after living in in Guatemala moving to Spain I'm perfectly happy and confident having conversations that go further than just taking a cab or ordering <laughs> something in a restaurant some of these uh, things that Pauline and Jim are saying Travis these resonate with your research about why people go to Mexico yeah I mean I think one thing that I was surprised about is how many people arrived in my Mexico site unseen so you know while there is a lot of other countries that they're looking at you know Panama certainly one of them Costa Rica Belize most of the people that chose Mexico that was their first and only choice and and most of them had not even made a visit there before wow. they site moved which you know actually having started my original research in 2008 and and published the the book at the end of 2019 beginning of 2020 I've kind of got this 10 years of data to look at and so 10 years ago, that wasn't so much the case. Um, most people had a friend or a family member who had retired down there. They had gone down and had a visit, figured out if they liked it or not, and then decided to return. I think as with the advent of the, not the advent necessarily, but the improvements of the internet and the ability to do video conferences and more websites and more content, a lot more people felt more comfortable arriving in Mexico just based on the research that they had done online. 
you know, with regard to why they ended up choosing Mexico, I mean, one, definitely the proximity to the United States, you know, makes it really easy. And as Jim was saying, you know, for people who are trying to kind of put a toe in the international, you know, moving experience, you know, outside of Canada, you can't get much closer to Mexico. And then I think of the people who did do a little more exploration, you know, I can't say this from a data perspective, just from talking to people, but, you know, Belize was another popular place that they looked at and they just felt like that didn't really have the infrastructure that they wanted. You know, it was a a lot more rural and a lot more bumpy roads than than they were up for, you know, Costa Rica. The general consensus was that that had kind of gotten too expensive and priced a lot of people out of what they at least what they wanted for comparable living. And I think Panama is kind of a similar thing to you know, the kinds of places that they wanted to live in were still more expensive than the places that they had found in Mexico. Did you find that people arrived in Mexico with a pretty good grasp of what their budget would be? Because one thing I find in Guatemala, yeah, sure, you can eat rice and beans and live in a shack for 300 bucks a month. But a lot of people arrived there and say, oh, my God, what? You want $1,000 for a beautiful furnished two bedroom that's crazy i can live in insert bad suburbs of the us or very remote location for the same price and and sure you can but you would not live in the best neighborhood of town etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think at least in in my case i've seen a lot of people get surprised about that and how western amenities come usually with a pretty steep price you can do a lot of living before we have Travis answer that. You can do a lot of living in Texarkana, Pauline, for a thousand bucks. Just, just saying. <laughs> Here. But, I'm, but, I'm but, in San Diego, so I, I don't know what's, <laughs> what money buys anymore. It's crazy. <laughs> Travis, uh, people surprise? People get some sticker shock? No. I mean, like even, you know, even in some of Mexico's most expensive places, they're still 20%, you know, less expensive than the median cost of living here, right? So like, I've got another book coming out that really just kind of digs into expat communities in general and kind of looks at the financial stuff. And and I use Denver as the as the average cost of living, because Denver kind of represented not just because I live here, but I ended up kind of representing the average cost of living, you know, and there's, there's really nice neighborhoods in Mexico City that that are comparable to that. But what you're, what you're not seeing, and why people love Mexico so much is because you're not seeing that that rent also comes with, you know, a gardener and a pool in your house, and it comes with medical care that's only 20% of the cost of medical care in the United States. So so even if you end up living in one of those really expensive communities, if you do your residency right, you still have this other cost savings that makes it well worth it. Jim? To your point, Travis, I mean, when we came here to uh, Boquete, Panama, we're in the, the mountains here, but it's a big expat community. And you probably already know that. But we expected the cost to be a lot less than it actually is. And that's not to say that it's not less expensive than probably Denver or whatever. I mean, we're paying, we have a beautiful place that we're living in a condo and it's $1,100 a month for a three bedroom, two bath, fully furnished. And it comes with a bunch of amenities like access to a full gym and all that kind of stuff. And that's certainly cheaper. And I'm sure if we didn't live right in this expat area, like Pauline was talking about, if we kind of blended in a little bit more with the Panamanian uh, lifestyles, we could probably get much cheaper prices and everything. But, But in general, the expats have driven up the prices here probably over the last decade or two, where it is it is a little more costly than uh, a lot of people expect, especially if they're doing like uh, like we were talking about going sight unseen, showing up, people do that. And then their their minds just blown like, whoa, wait a minute. I was not expecting this at all. Yeah. I mean, you're right. Like the expats drive up the prices in certain neighborhoods, but I've also found that you can walk three blocks and save 80% right. over what you purchased for dinner three blocks into where the expats are. So I think the braver you are, the more you can expect to save. That's what I'll say. You know, the, the more up for an adventure you are, the better you're going to do. So um, true. Yeah, If you want to go to Point of Arta and live right on the beach in a condo full of other Americans and Canadians, you're going to pay some pretty comparable pricing to coastal towns in the United States. If you're willing to get five or 10 blocks off of the beach in Puerto Vallarta, you're going to have a, a totally different, more authentic and definitely more affordable experience. 
Travis, I'm glad you brought up bravery because that brings up my next question, which is the reason a lot of people don't move abroad is because of fear. There are things that they fear. Uh, Jim, I'll, I'll go back to you. Were there were things that you were afraid of when you moved to Panama that you thought, wow, there's no reason I should have been afraid of this at all? <laughs> I don't think there was much. I, I I think the biggest concern that we had was the language difference. We thought not being fluent in Spanish was going to be just a really tough hurdle to get past. But we we learned once we got here that as long as you're trying, then there's that appreciation that the Panamanians have and they'll go out of their way to do their darndest to help you. And I'm, again, I'm not saying it's not worth learning the language. I mean, that's a, that's a huge help. And we're studying and practicing every single day, but it's not something we really needed to worry about as, as much as we thought we would. Pauline, when you moved out to that beautiful lake and man, you had some people giving you hell uh, when you were trying to build that uh, the community. I remember the, all the real estate you were working on building did you anticipate the problem with authorities that you kind of got? And was there anything that you were kind of afraid of that ended up not being a big deal? So I, I built a little guest house and then I built my own residence and went through all the red tape you could possibly imagine. And it does not apply to locals. And locals had just that way of going through their cousin who likes the mayor or putting a little <laughs> bribe here and there. And yeah, because you were not... trying to, you were trying to develop uh, several pieces of land, right? Weren't you subdividing a piece of land at one point? Yeah, it was 90 acres in total uh, that I, I was trying to split into a hundred plots to make a uh, hundred, eventually a hundred plots for people who wanted to move there and make a little community. And it was hell, but nothing to be afraid of. I got concerned a little bit because of the, the geographical position. It's it's in the jungle next to the border with Mexico. And if you look at all the drugs maps, uh, that is where it comes from the south and goes to the north. But in eight years, I, I haven't seen anything. I don't even lock my house most of the time. It stays open when I have guests. I'm like, you guys just let yourselves in and I'll see you tomorrow morning. So it's been really great. I, I'm always concerned. Like I was mentioning immigration previously. And right now that I moved to the U.S. and I'm waiting for a green card, I have a work permit. But, you know, always try to do things right. And sometimes some countries make it a little more complicated. Like this year, I was trying to pay my property taxes in Guatemala. And they said, well, you need to bring the proof that you paid last year. I'm like, you guys have the records? Oh, no, we don't. Because the guy who charged you last year, he doesn't work there anymore because he kept the money. <laughs> so... I had to prove that I did pay in order not to be charged for last year. They just wanted to know, hey, did you not pay or did the guy steal your money? <laughs> like, and it's fun more than anything. No, no big scares. I love how you can end that with that's fun. <laughs> 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 Travis, back to Mexico. I last just before COVID went to Cabo and I remember, which is so Mexican by the way, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> and I get off the plane there. And, and of course the first thing somebody tells me about are the gangs, right. And about these people that got murdered and you think, Oh my goodness, this is a lawless place. And much of that uh, unfounded. Well, I, you know, I always say that Mexico is a dangerous place for certain people. And fortunately it's not dangerous at all for expats. Unfortunately, it is very dangerous for people who are in or near the drug trade or who are politicians or police officers in the states that have heavy drug presence. But that violence rarely, rarely, rarely spills over to the expat community. And as I kind of often say, it's kind of like the shark attack phenomenon, right? We hear about every single shark attack that happens because they're actually so rare. And that's the same thing with violence against expats in Mexico. We hear about it every single time it happens because it is so extraordinarily rare. So should people be on the lookout? Uh, yeah, of course. But the chances of them being shot and killed are actually greater in Detroit, in Washington, D.C., in New Orleans than they are in any of the 
cities or communities in Mexico. Mexico oh. loves the tourism dollars way too much to allow for any of that. And they've, they've doubled down on security and measures to encourage more tourism and bring more dollars. Yeah. You know, I mean, just this is my own opinion, but I think a lot of those drugs that end up in the United States and I don't think it'd be very good for business if U.S. and Canadian citizens ended up being the, the target of drug violence. Jim, what about uh, in Panama? Safety is like that was one of our big concerns moving here. And that is not a big deal here. I mean, just like Travis was saying, I mean, there's plenty of cities in the U.S. where you'd have to be uh, a lot more careful than you would here. I, I know when, when we first moved here, obviously, anywhere you go, you always want to be looking over your shoulder a little bit. You want to be smart. But uh, when we first moved here, we were very cautious just because we're in a different country. We don't know anything about this. So even walking back home, we, we weren't staying out at night. And then eventually that changed. And when we'd be walking home in the evenings, maybe from a restaurant or something like that, there was no fear. There were no worries. There were no concerns. It wasn't like like we felt, oh, my gosh, there could be somebody around the corner here that wants to jump here. So there's not. And, and even in, in most of Panama, guns are not a common thing. It's not. I mean, it, it's pretty hard to get a gun here in general but you're just not going to find a lot of that anyway. So you don't find a lot of violence or, or much here. It's usually more petty theft, I'd say, than anything and not anything extraordinary either. I want to wrap up this discussion, but I have two questions. And the next one, I'd like you guys to just give me a fairly quick answer. Uh, the state of healthcare, because somebody's going to move to where you are or where you've been or where you've studied, they're obviously going to do a deeper dive there. But, but Jim, healthcare in Panama, good, bad or ugly? Uh, very good. Even if we move back now that I understand medical tourism is actually a real thing, it's not as scary as it sounds. I would absolutely consider if I had a, a surgery that I needed to do or something flying out of the U.S. And, and coming, maybe not necessarily to Panama, but another country in general. Pauline in Guatemala? Uh, very good in the city. You have a lot of uh, U.S. trained surgeons, doctors, again, at a fraction of the price. Even here in San Diego, I often cross over to Tijuana to get dental or vet care because they, the prices are just a fraction. And I, I don't think there's anything to be concerned about. You can find the quality health care you need. Uh, Travis in Mexico? Um, if you're on the nationalized health care there, the biggest complaint is it takes longer to be seen for routine checkups in health care. But as far as the quality of the care, no real complaints. I want to end with this discussion and Travis, because yours is a study and you weren't there yourself. I'm going to ask you generally for the people that you talk to, but then for Pauline and for Jim, what life lessons have you learned from this? Is there some big aha that people don't get when they don't have these adventures? Travis and the people you talk to, uh, is there some big aha they get, some big fantastic life thing that they wouldn't get just staying in the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, I did travel to a dozen of these communities and have spent a lot of time in Mexico every year. And it's the same kind of aha that I have, too. And it's this idea that there's this peace and respite from all of the crazy activity and consumerism of the United States. I mean, on one hand, you're just not familiar with it. So you're not feeling the bombardment of the billboards and the advertisements and things. So it's not to say that they're not there. They just don't kind of feel applicable to you. And two, you're kind of on an adventure, you know, you're in an unfamiliar place. And so your brain's kind of open to learning and figuring things out. And, and in that, there's just kind of this real break from the madness. And like I said, the consumerism of the United States. And I think even though, you know, money may be something that drives people down there that makes them interested in leaving. I think once they get there, that that kind of peaceful feeling and slower pace of life and a change in the priorities is what keeps them there. Jim? Yeah, I mean, I think Travis kind of nailed it. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of people in the U.S. have these preconceived notions about other countries. And in reality, it's not true. And, you know, when we moved here, I had a lot of people come up half joking, saying, oh, you're crazy. You guys are going to be living in huts in Panama. And, and, and we're not. We, I mean, we live in a tent. No, I'm just kidding. We're, <laughs> we're in a, a beautiful condo and everything. But that's not even like it. It's it's amazing. It's 75 degrees here every day. The mountain landscapes, they're amazing. The, the flowers are vivid. The people are wonderful. I mean, it's just it's, it's almost like a wake up call that you're like, wow, you, you can go other places in the world 
and they're not scary. They're not like as bad as uh, as what you might have thought at one point in life. It, it's OK to leave the, the U.S. and check out, out other places in the world. Pauline, you didn't leave the U.S. You left France initially, but uh, you've got the last word. Yeah, I think it's it's really helped me to get a, a bird eye view of my life as it was, my relationships with my friends. Like I can see after being away for 17 years, who do I want to see when I go back to Paris? Who do I want to spend my time, my most valuable resource with? And just the general adaptability and how the first country, the first move, yeah, it's, it's big, it's daunting. And then the second one is just a little bit easier. And now I just grab a suitcase and off I go. And seeing how locals, for example, in Guatemala are so resourceful, so resilient, how in the U.S. it can be a big deal when people lose power for six hours. And in Guatemala, we've had to make do for a whole week and a whole freezer full of meat, runes and et cetera, stuff that breaks in the middle of the jungle and the nearest store is an hour and a half away. And you just make it work somehow. I think that's a, a pretty valuable life lesson. You you come back a different person, more adaptable easy going and things that you had your nose on before that were very big deals. Suddenly you reflect back and you're like, well, that didn't matter. (laughs) Well, stackers, when you're done with us, I think a great show to listen to next is our friend Don McDonald and Tom Cox show talking real money. Don is one of the first nationally uh, financial talk show host, nationally financial talk show host. That's good. Joe. But it's national financial talk shows, starting with Business Radio Network in 1988. Tom is a former host of Serious Money on PBS. And together, they focus on making managing your money easy and understandable based on solid science. Of course, you've heard Don here on our Friday Roundtable. He stopped by the basement last week. Dude's got a voice. Just saying, he's not just a voice, though. He knows that investing is too simple to be as complicated as Wall Street would like you to believe. And just like Stacking Benjamins, it's more than educational. It's actually entertaining. Don and Tom both have this unique skill set as broadcasters and explainer people on one end, but also people that have this background in finance and can talk as experts. Learn how to invest better, worry less, and spend less in fees and commissions. You're going to get straightforward, honest advice on building the wealth you need for a more secure future. Listen to them wherever you're listening to us. Talking Real Money Podcast. Go check it out. That's the Talking Real Money Podcast wherever you're listening to us now. As school cycled through spring break in the United States, many of you may be wondering, how do I give my kids a curriculum about uh, money? And one guy I know who's very, very in touch with this topic and also very worried about it is our friend uh, Benny Notchman. This is the Friday FinTech segment of our show where we learn about some new solution to a problem that people have. And today... We're going to talk about kids and money. And man, do we have an app for you to talk about that? We just discovered it is called Jasby, J A S S B Y. And uh, let's find out about it together. Say hello to our friend, Benny Notchman. And here he comes down to the basement. Our friend, Benny Notchman, is here. How are you, man? I'm very, very good. Good morning. Well, good morning to you, sir. I'm so happy to talk to you because, as you know, parents really struggle with teaching their kids about money and with financial responsibility. I remember when my kids were young, you know, when we tell them, Betty, that we didn't have any money, they'd say, well, why don't you just put it on a card? Like, that's 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 all we got to do. So, <laughs> exactly. So that's my issue. How did you and the team come up with Jasby? Tell me about how it all started. You know, I have a, a little bit of a background in uh, in fintech. Uh, what you call financial technology, right? So I'm uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I'm, I've been doing this for a while. So my first company was when I was in law school. So I used to practice for a few years. But then in around 2007, late 2007, I started a company before Jaspi that's called Credorax, which is a, it's a B2B boring 
uh, boring story, <laughs> but what it is, it's a processing bank, acquiring bank and processor. So we serve thousands of merchants all over the world. We're licensed as a bank in, I don't know, over 20 countries, uh, and we process billions and billions of dollars in traffic. So I've, I've been doing fintech for a while. I've been the CEO of, uh, of my previous company in, until 2016. I'm still heavily involved, but in 2016, as I said, I decided to take a kind of a year off, uh, brought in a professional CEO and did some consulting and did some relaxing time. And during that time, I started looking deeper into an issue that bothered me for a while. So I'm a dad of two kids. I have two boys. Uh, one is 10, one is 12. And over the years, so, you know, it, it's two things that kind of drove my attention is one is that I, at a certain age, they started asking for allowance and all of the, you know, friends were getting an allowance. So I started giving them allowance and it was always, it was difficult. You know, uh, when they were very young, I, every Sunday morning, it was my job to give them $3 each, you know, half the time I didn't remember the other half, I didn't have $3 on me. <laughs> like I had a 20 or a 10, but like, I didn't have a three and the other half. And I know it's three halves now. I don't know, something else happened. I was traveling or, or whatnot. Yeah. So it was never easy. And then even when I remembered and like, you know, if I skipped a week or two, I would pay them back. But then when they wanted something, most of the time it was some video game or something that they needed to download or something. They couldn't use the cash. So they would come to me with those like crumbled $1 bills that they stuffed into the piggy bank and, and said, hey, dad, can I use your credit card? I'm going to pay you back. And the whole thing was like awkward. Well, and what's funny, it, it, and what's funny, by the way, not to cut you off, not only is it awkward, because that's how I grew up too, is with the crumpled cash. That's not the way you and I use money anymore. Like nobody exactly. uses it. So we're teaching kids this way of using money that we don't even use. Exactly. So you never have cash. It's exactly that. But the second thing that really kind of, so you know, because of my job and I ran a bank for, for about a decade, my kids and our, you know, our family, our, our neighbors, the community, we always, I, I used to, before Corona, I used to coach the, the flag football team. So we always, people know that I'm in banking and in fintech and it always drove interesting conversations. One of the things that you pay attention to is that one, nobody talks to kids about money. They don't talk to them about money in school. There is in the vast majority of states in the United States, money and financial literacy is not in the curriculum. It's just it's like it doesn't exist. Yeah. But most households don't talk about money uh, with the kids as well. So we don't talk about money privately, like in our own private life, but also not publicly. We don't do it at schools. And therefore, what happens is that those kids, they grow up and, and think about how much money and energy and intention and love and effort Right, the whole system pours into one kid from kindergarten until after college, and nobody ever talks about financial literacy. And then when they become young adults, when they go to college and they take a, a loan or sign up for a credit card, and they don't understand what APR is or why it's not a good idea to only pay the minimum payments, we say, hey, those new generation, those kids, they don't understand, they're irresponsible, but it's not their fault. We never talk to them about it ever. So the combination of those two things, which how much it was awkward and difficult to give my kids allowance and how nobody ever talked to them about money. So in my household, we talk about money all the time. Cause again, that was my job, Yeah. but I saw how unusual that was and strange and how people like would shy away from it. This drove me to look deeper into the market. And then I noticed, so I found out that an average teenager in the U S spends about $3,000 a year. That's a lot of money. Wow. $3,000. You know, if you Google it, you will see a range that's between twenty four, twenty five hundred to 3000 a year. Yeah. Normally those pieces of data are kind of backdated, uh, like a research that was done a couple of years before. They grow year over year. I don't know what happened last year with Corona, so that might have changed a little bit. Sure. But generally speaking, over the last decade or 15 years, it's been a steady growth, like 5, 7, 10% KGAR. And yes, those are the numbers. Anywhere between twenty five hundred to three thousand dollars a year and growing. Well, that's and you, a lot of money. Well, absolutely. And I think about also a dichotomy with two things you said to me. Number one is on one hand, you're giving your kids three dollars to trust them with. On the other hand, they're spending three thousand probably out of dad's wallet, right? So kids are making these these buying decisions. And when dad's not around, they go to college or they leave the house, they do whatever, all of a sudden they gotta make these big decisions and they've never had cash. So no, the $3 when they were in kindergarten oh, or first gotcha. grade, so they were very, very young. Yeah. 
Uh, obviously, you don't give the same to a five-year-old as you would give to a to a fourteen-year-old. So yes, it's most of it is from parents. I'd say 65, 70% is from parents and grandparents. And then kids have afternoon jobs. They babysit. They feed the cat or the neighbor. You know, they do all kinds of stuff. Still, the vast majority comes from uh, from the family. And this is just the money that we give them directly. So this amount of money that I've mentioned is money that they control directly. It's not influence. It's not, hey, dad, uh... it's a good idea. I like this car over the other. If you add that to on top of it, that we're talking trillions, you know, in, sure. in the U.S. economy. But um Direct money, it's about $3,000 a year. My thought was, do a few things. One, make the whole thing easier for the parents. Before we even talk about what it does for the kid, it's easier for the parents. So make it digital, make it automatic, so you can set it up and forget about it if you want. Make it safe, make it uh, so you can control and observe and know what, what they're doing. And then on top of all of this is teach them something. So talk about financial literacy. And, you know, I, I always... Talk to people, you and I, before the camera went on, uh, we joked about the gospel of Jasby. And, and that's kind of how, this is kind of how I really think about it. Because, you know, in this country, and this is, it's not only the U.S., by the way, this is a Western kind of uh, hemisphere problem. This is across the world, from Germany to Japan to Israel. This is this is everywhere. So we do a few things. We, as I said, we don't talk to our kids about money, not at home, not at school. Each, by the way, I think have a different reason why, and we can talk about it if you want. But then when we once in a while talk about financial literacy, it's always in a negative, downward, condescending, criticizing way. Again, like those kids, they're, they're dumb. They don't know what they're doing. What I'm trying to do is, again, bring the gospel of financial literacy. So let's talk about how with a series of relatively easy steps, you can do so much better. And it's not difficult. And what you need to do is just do it, talk about it, and then do it. Yeah. Let's dive into then how the product works. So many of the founders that we talk to, Benny, it's either web-based or it's an app. How do I get my hands on Jasby? So it's both. It's web-based and it's an app. Cool. And it's a cloud. So here's how you do it. So in order to get started, and, and the service is completely free, and I'll talk, and I'll talk about this in a second, you go to jasby.com, and this is J-A-S-S-B-Y.com. You know, you put your email in, and, and you click get started. Sign up takes a few minutes. Uh, by the way, a word here, this is not sign up for some video game that you give us a made-up uh, email and uh, one, two, three password. This is a financial service, so there are a lot of regulations and rules around this, and when we need to be careful and follow the rules. And also, you want us, or you, the user, want us to be careful because, you know, we, we want to be safe around, around money. So we need to verify people's identity, so we need to collect their full legal names and address and phone number, and also social security number. Social security number is only used for identification. It's not used. There's no credit check associated. You will not be reported in any way to the credit bureaus. It's nothing like that. We are not linked to the credit bureaus. We don't share information with anybody. It's for verification. So we want to know that that you are who you say you are. And it looks like, too, when it comes to security, just looking at your stuff, you're using the same security levels that banks use, it appears. Yes. Yes. So again, it's you have to and you want to. It's a combination of both, right? Sure. So yeah, it's how the system works. And and again, you want to because you want to yep. you want to be safe and secure. So yes, absolutely. So once you you complete your sign up, and sign up can take three minutes to five, six minutes. It depends on how many people you onboard, if you will, into your family. So it can be you, just you and and, and one kid, right? Let's so let's say for me a dad and, and my older boy, or I can uh, bring my wife and my second son into this and I can go maybe also bring grandma. So the more people you have, you'll have to key in a few more names and date of birth and stuff like that. Once you have approved, you can then choose between two product clients. So we have what we call the Jasmine Preferred, which is an allowance account, which is a bank account and the ability to deposit money and, and save and the kids can see how much money they have. They can save it. They can shop at the Jasby shop. So we offer an in-app or online shop that is completely curated by us. You can uh, see it at shop.jasby.com. And there, kids can buy video games, a little bit of fashion, accessories, tech, books, pet supplies, stuff that, that kids want. Or if you want, you can add to this a debit card. 
It's a MasterCard. We do it in cooperation with MasterCard. And then you get a debit card that you can use anywhere that MasterCard is accepted. So, I don't know, go buy coffee or a burger at McDonald's or wherever your favorite joint is. So you can do both. In either case, the service is free, including if you sign up for the debit card, the debit card is free. Uh, And the way you use it is that you set up allowance and the setup allowance you can do, again, directly from your phone and it's with a few clicks and you can set it up to be recurring. So I don't know, let's say every Sunday morning, $30, or you can control it. You say, no, I want this, that I would initiate it. And you can say it once a month and you can say it once a week. It's completely up to you. You can also set up chores and reward for them. You can set up academic um, goals and reward for them. And grandma and grandpa can do the same thing. So what we see is, you know, a lot of the, most of the parents do around allowance and chores and academics and and the grandparents do the fun things, the birthdays and holidays and, and stuff like that. So the kids would get the money immediately. It's all done real time. And then they can do one of three things. They can save they can do good. We work with a list of 25, I think, nationwide charities that each can find the goal that speaks to him or her and, and do some good and donate. And the third thing they can do is, is spend. So they can shop in our in-house shopping mall and they can spend using the debit cards. But whatever they do, they learn, right? So I always tell people when the kids are young, give them an allowance on a weekly basis. And Why? Because when they're younger or when they just start, give them a smaller amount of money every week because they will make mistakes. And it's okay that they make mistakes. It's almost, it's almost better than they make mistakes. But whatever the mistake would be, it's short-lived, right? Because then Sunday comes and it's all erased and it doesn't matter and they get a fresh amount of money and it all starts over. So if they made a mistake, okay, they'll be sad for a few days and, it's, and it doesn't matter. So the budgeting even if you, you don't have to call it like that, you don't have to use the word, but that's what happens, right? Mm-hmm. So you tell them, hey, here's your $10. It's you for the week. Don't come talk to me about money again until next Sunday. You want to buy whatever you want to buy? It's your decision. It's also a message of empowerment. Whatever mistakes they make, it will happen. And then next Sunday, it's all going to be okay. So they learn that for this week, from Sunday to Sunday, they need to budget and think about what they want. And if they go spend it the, the first 10 minutes they got it, then tomorrow they won't have anything. It will happen once or twice, then they very quickly catch up. As the kids grow up a little bit, they've been doing this for a while, move it once a month. Then they need to plan for a month, and it's, and it's great. One of the things that you will see, by the way, even with younger kids, is that it, I don't know if it completely eliminates, but it produces whining, temper tantrums, because it's a message of empowerment. Yes. Don't come to me, ask for this candy or that video game. It's all you, man. Like you have the ability to decide. You have your money. You want a candy, go buy the candy. You want the game, go buy the game. It's it's all good. And if you want the video game that's more expensive, save it. Save the money exactly. up and, 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 and get it later. That's yeah. some powerful stuff. And I love the stuff you're talking about, because it seems to me, Benny, that Jasby's not best used alone. I think it's best used with discussions, right? I mean, it's a combination of technology and discussions with parents, but not until after they've had the opportunity to make mistakes. Making mistakes is a hundred percent good. It's not a bad thing. Just have them make those mistakes young and for five or ten dollars, not at nineteen for fifty thousand dollars. And this is how we learn it's okay. And more than anything. I think one of the biggest mistakes that we're making as a society is that we never talk about those things. Yeah. I always tell people the rare occasions when, when we do talk about this, it's always very boring, very academic, very condescending. So today, kids, we're going to talk about interest. They're not going to listen to you anyway. So you don't need to do all of those things. What you need to do is talk about allowance and talk about you know, how you use it. And if they make a mistake, let them and then say, you know, next week, think about doing that and that. And when you do this at seven, eight, nine year old, all they need is once, twice, a week or two. They'll get the hang of it very, very quickly. And you'll see then how they'll become very interested. I I can tell you that my younger son, when, when we started, he would just watch for a while. He wouldn't even buy anything. He would just watch his balance on the app goes up and he would enjoy it. And then we started talking about small things. You know, if you save money, 
maybe you gain a little bit of interest. So interest is your friend. If you would do the opposite one day and you borrow money because you think you don't have enough for the video game, so you want to borrow $10, then you need to pay interest because this is how it works. Then interest is your enemy. So with the few sentences, very casual, matter of fact, day to day, you introduce things that a lot of young adults don't know. This is not new. Probably a year or two ago, before Corona, there was a survey done. So two things I think that were interesting. So I think about 70% of millennials said that they would rather go to the dentist than to their bank mm. in very similar number, maybe a little bit less, 63, 65%. There were a few questions, very basic. If you borrowed, I think a thousand dollars and you needed to pay 15% APR, how much money would you owe after a year? And 63, 65% couldn't do the math, right? They didn't know what an APR, what, what it means. Again, that's crazy. And it's our fault. Yeah. So start early, very easy going. You don't need to be Warren Buffett to use it. Just give your kids a few dollars, teach them a few basic, basic concepts. Again, not as a lecture or not as a, just, just as a matter of, you'll see it will come. Even if you don't say anything, they will come ask you. That sounds like a tagline, by the way, Jasby, you don't want it to be Warren Buffett to use it. That's your new tagline. <laughs> uh, parents also, I want to be clear here. You've also set it up though, that while the child's making a mistake, you can see those all online on Jasby, right? I can, I can monitor my child's activity yes. so I can, if they're really stepping in it, I can step in. Of course. So every time they do anything, especially spend, you get real time notifications. So of course you can read the statements and see what happened last week, last day, last month, whatever you want, but you also get real, real time notifications, right? So somebody just, uh, so your kid, not somebody, yeah. kid uh, A just bought X for $12. The other thing that you need to remember is that we're talking about a debit card. There is no lending here. There is no credit. There is no, you can't get in trouble. So right. if you give your kid $20, there's no way for them to spend anything other than those $20. They can't spend one cent above. There is no Jasby margin account. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you come up with the name? Where does the name come from? So remember Seinfeld, the show about nothing? Yeah. So I was looking for a name that didn't mean anything, that you would Google it before Jazby existed. There would be, uh, and I tried. So I, I had a number of names that I was thinking about. Yeah. And when you Google them, you get two results. There would be nothing. So I wanted Jazby because it sounded easy to say because it sounds a tiny bit like just be, yeah. which I like. Yeah. And because it didn't have any prior meaning. So we can put our own meaning into it. I love that. And then uh, with everything being free, how do you guys make money, Benny? That's a great question. So, you, you know, there's this old saying, I forgot, I should have talked about this. You know, there's this old uh, saying that if it's free, then you are the product. Right then it's not. It's not in our case. So the way we make money is because whenever you buy something using the card, the same as it is always with any card that you have, the merchant, the retailer, the business that you're buying from, they pay what's known as interchange. So that means when you go to the supermarket and you buy groceries for $100, the supermarket doesn't actually get $100. They usually get about 97 so 3% is interchange, and that goes to Visa, to MasterCard, to the issuer, to us. To, to Gotcha. This is how the industry works. Again, this is not unique to Jazby in any way. This is how all the cards work for the last 70 years. So this is how we, we get our money from the merchants, not from the users. Gotcha. And then a Jazby account, if I am setting up my allowance, do I have an account at Jazby as well as a parent? And then my money's coming from my account to their account, or is it coming from my bank? How does that work? It comes from your bank. So we work today with all, literally all the banks. I think the actual percent is probably 97, but yeah, uh, we've never actually found one that doesn't <laughs> right. uh, connect to us. So you can use your regular bank, whoever you work with, it doesn't matter. And then you can do two things. You can use your debit card that is associated with your bank, right? Am I making sense? Yep. With your regular debit gotcha. card that associated with your checking account, or you can do ACH. You, the, the same way that you would pay a utility bill. Right. And then what happens is that, so let's, let's talk, for example, about, I don't know, a, a, a dad. I'm, I'm always thinking about myself, right? A dad with two boys. So what you would do, I, I would link my own debit card from Bank of America. 
And then in Jasmine, you have a family wallet. So let's say I want to upload $100 into Jasmine. I would upload $100 into the family wallet. And then from there, once you have the, the $100, which is almost immediately, you say, okay, my older son, I want to give him $20. My younger son, I want to give him 10 so they can spend. And then it will be 70 still remains in, this, in the family wallet, 20 to my older son and 10 to the, to the younger son. And tomorrow morning, I want to give another 10 to the younger son so I can do this with a click of the button and so on and so forth. Gotcha. It's called Jasby. We will link to it on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. Benny, thanks a ton for hanging out with us today and talking Jasby, but even more important, just talking about financial literacy and educating our kids. Cause I think like you do, man, that's so important. Thank you so much. Hey, stackers. I'm your pal, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And yeah, let's turn this tale from international to something pretty much known as a U.S. pastime, drive-in movies. Did you know that the first indoor movie theater opened up on this date in 1902? And of course, that reminds me of the first time I went to a drive-in. Oh, man. It was the summer of 85, and I really wanted to get some action. So me and LaFonda headed down to the local drive-in movie theater, made sure to get there really, really early and get a spot with lots of privacy. You know, for obvious reasons. I mean, you do the math. And then I slowly took her top down, and I really revved her engine, you know what I mean? And people around us said to cool it because they couldn't hear the movie. But, I mean, w- w- what did they expect me to do? I had an opportunity. It's become one of my fondest fondest memory. I mean, that was the that was the night I, I really grew up and became a man, you know? Well, uh, okay, before I get too sentimental, let's get to today's trivia. Speaking of movie theaters, you can't fully enjoy a movie without a soda and some popcorn. So how about this? In 2019, how much did the U.S. theater industry rake in from food and beverage sales? I'll be back with your answer faster than you can start up your favorite flick. All right, we brief the team backstage about this show. And if you're new to the Stacking Benjamins podcast, you will not know that we have a year-long competition going on between our three contributors. I thought we'd keep the sexes the same to keep it easy. So Paula, you're playing on behalf of Paula Pant from Afford Anything. So Pauline to Paula, there's not that, you know, that's 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 not a leap. And then we have the smartest guy on uh the podcast i would say is len penzo because he's the two-time returning champion so travis you're the researcher so you'll be playing on behalf of len penzo and then the most adventurous person of course my co-host og and jim you're an adventurer and so we thought you'd be the uh og surrogate og is winning with five len has four paula has three which means jim as the champion or the surrogate i guess for the champion you get the first stab at this thing. We got this, OG. I went ahead and memorized the entire internet before in preparation <laughs> for this trivia question. So we got this for sure. That's a small flex. <laughs> small flex. Let's think about this. So the so this is the movie theater in general. What did they make in 2019 on food and beverages yeah. for the entire year? I love those, by the way, while you're thinking, Jim, I love the dollar movie theaters where it cost a dollar to get in in like 1850 for a, for a popcorn, another eight. We, we were at a theater yesterday and you know, they've just opened up theaters again. So Cheryl and I went to see one, $4 for a uh, bottled water, $4. Wow. Yeah. We're big on going to the drive-in and that is exactly what would take place. You go in and it'd be, you know, like three bucks a person and then they go, all right, but if you're... They do an honor system. They go, but if you're bringing your own food and beverage, give us uh, 20 or $30. You're just uh, No, that's that's part of what, how they roll. <laughs> <laughs> that's so, crazy. I mean, this is going to be far reaching. I mean, you'd <clears throat> think I would know this one, but I'm going to go with $1.375 billion is going to be my number. $1.375 billion is the anchor. Travis, you're playing on behalf of Len who finds himself down by one now. So no pressure here, big guy. Uh, do I don't think? have to give that long of an explanation, do I? I can just give my number. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. It's got to be all drawn up. Well, let's see. There's 325 million people. Uh, I, let's see, at $16 an average ticket, I'm going to go $6.6 billion. 
$6.6 billion. And because Paula's in last place, Pauline, that means you get to go last. So what do you think? You got Travis at $6.6 billion, OG Jim at uh, $1.375 billion. I was thinking something like Jim's number. So I, yeah, I think Travis's might be a, a little high. So I'm going to go somewhere in the middle. I'm going to go with um, 3.2 billion. 3.2 billion dollars. Well, I'd love to tell you who is going to win this thing, but we can't do that yet. We'll be right back. Well, do you own or rent your home? Sure you do. And I bet it can be hard work. You know, it's easy. Bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowners or renters insurance along with your auto policy. And it's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. Jim, playing on behalf of OG, you are significantly lower, my friend, than the other two. They think that we're stuffing ourselves full of popcorn and peanuts more than you do. I'm playing the low end of the spectrum here. <laughs> it's going to happen. We and, got this. And Travis, how how comfortable you're feeling now at the top guy at 6.6. That's uh, 3 billion higher than the next uh, next highest person. I'm feeling pretty good. Still being in the United States, I know our consumer priorities and, <laughs> and I, know, I know what we're capable of. <laughs> it was, now, if it was a Mexican theater, would it change things? Oh, $27 <laughs> for, for the year for, for everybody. Year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Everybody for, would bring their own on the, their <laughs> first. <right. laughs> and then Pauline splitting the difference. How you feeling? I'm feeling pretty good. Although 6 billion is only like five bucks an American. So we, we might be way off still. We're about to see Pauline's got 3.2 billion. All right, Doug, what's our answer? Hey, trivia fans, I, I am your very disappointed host, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. The texts have been rolling in over the last few minutes and talking about how this is a family show and why would I share such a racy story? Racy? Well, first off, get your minds out of the gutter, people. This is not at all a sultry tale. I said I wanted to get some action, so I went to watch Tron, like the best action movie of all time. And I went with my car that I named La Fonda because who doesn't name their first car, especially after Napoleon Dynamite? I, mean, I wanted privacy. You know me, I got a tender heart. I didn't know what that movie would bring. I, there could be some like soft, teary parts in there. And if I got emotional, I should be in the privacy of my own car. And then I took the top down because it was a convertible. Uh, that's not hard to figure out. And I had to rev LaFonda's engine every few minutes because the damn thing wouldn't start and I didn't want to get stranded. That's it. Nothing more. I don't know how you did the math you did to get where you got. Hope you all feel disgusted with yourselves. I sure know I am. Blech. Think you've had enough. So let's get back to today's trivia and just clean this all up a little bit, okay? The question was, in 2019, how much did the U.S. theater industry rake in from food and beverage sales? If you guessed 5.7 billion, you'd be right. I'm guessing that number is going to be just a smidge lower for 2020. Anyway, that reminds me, I could really use some popcorn right about now. See ya. Oh. <laughs> Travis That's goes. A lot of popcorn. That is a ton of popcorn. Well, I don't know, man. It like twelve dollars a tub, Pauline. That's that's still <laughs> not really that, that much sure. popcorn. Is there any? I'm rule still thinking popcorn? Panamanian prices. Yeah. Yes, there is no price is right rule, Travis, to answer your question. You are the winner, my friend. Congratulations. All right. Well, that made being a guest worth it. <laughs> that, that, that was it. And, <laughs> and I'm, sure, I'm sure you'll get a big pat on the back from Mr. Penzo, too, to defend his honor. So nice job. <laughs> hey, let's take out the magnifying glass here and help somebody else do better with their money. Today's hotline call comes to us courtesy of magnifymoney.com. Jim, when you go to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money, you know what happens? Tell me, Joe. <laughs> you, you, nice job. <laughs> you, you find those financial products you use every day or nowhere near the best in class if you're just at your brick and mortar bank. Over 92% of the checking accounts, savings accounts, CDs, uh, reward cards, consolidation loans, all the banking products you use every day, all ranked head to head. 92% of them available online at Magnified Money. Go to stackybedjamins.com forward slash Magnified Money for more. And today, 
we're going to help Jake with his money. Say hi, Jake. Hey, Joe and OG and whoever else happens to be there today. It's it's Jake here. Uh, I'm a high school business teacher. And my question is, what is the best way to send stocks as a gift? With graduation coming up, I'm sure I'll have a few invites and instead of giving my students cash, I would really like to give them some sort of stock. I was thinking some sort of ETF or something like that. And I guess follow up question, is it possible to send a fractional share of the specific ones that I'm looking at are trading at $350. And as a high school teacher, I don't think I could afford that for all of my students. To the other listener of the show, I asked this question, uh, you better get thinking of one for the next one. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> no pressure on the other listener. Now, Jake asked his question. Thanks a ton, Jake. This was the closest one I could get to your expertise, guys, because living abroad, I also wonder about uh, mail service. I wonder about actually getting gifts abroad. And then I guess I'll ask you also if you have an answer to Jake's question, but no pressure there. Travis, the boomers in Mexico have trouble getting gifts or things uh, from the U.S.? Um I don't, I don't know. I don't have a, like a really good answer to this. What I can tell you actually is that I own a, an online pillow company. And so I do know that um, when customers try and get our pillows into Mexico, there can sometimes be challenges at the border, um, making sure that stuff is like quantified, and I don't said quantified, but is listed as personal use stuff instead of business stuff. So I know that businesses sometimes have trouble sending larger, more expensive items down because of the risk of it looking like you're trying to scoot the tariff system or whatever they have in place there. But by and large, though, you can get most of the things that you want from the United States down in Mexico, especially with the explosion of Walmart and Costco and stores like that. So, Is your pillow company slightly less controversial than the only other one I know? <laughs> <laughs> it is slightly less controversial. <laughs> well, t tell us which one. It t tell us what we, it is. As I say, we only want a sleep revolution. That's all we want. <laughs> That's uh, tell us the name of your company, if you don't mind. Uh, Queen Anne Pillow Company. Q U E E N A N N E Pillow dot com. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. I assume I'll have to pay for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll get Westwood One's reps here to. to well, I see the invoice just hit my so, inbox. Yeah, to swoop but... <laughs> in right now. Yes, that's where they get you. They say, "Come on for free," then they have you advertise stuff. Sure. Pauline, uh, well, actually, Travis, any advice for him about uh, shares? Have you ever sent uh, shares to a friend, relative, uh, shares of stock? I haven't sent shares, but I can tell you, I mean, just with regard to Mexico, currency is a really interesting thing to look at because of the way, you know, the volatility of the peso sometimes is as volatile as my Bitcoin. But, you know, people are really looking at when do I use pesos to buy something versus when do I bring in more dollars to buy something. So I'm, I may encourage him to look at currency and the peso and timing around uh, acquiring that. That's that's cool. Pauline, getting mail in Guatemala, any problems there? Uh, yes, it's impossible. So the, the postal service went bankrupt about, I would say, seven years ago. And as a result, uh, there's there's nothing. And I, I never had a mailbox because my house was too remote anyway. But now you have companies in the U.S. There are mailbox addresses where you can send your Amazon purchase. And then for about five bucks a pound, they will mail it to you in Guatemala to a shopping center or one of their distribution hubs and you can go pick it up there. So it's much faster than sending your own parcel because it, it takes the evening flight from Miami and then the next morning it's in Guatemala. That's pretty convenient. How close was your closest uh, mailbox? A couple hours away. Okay. So it's things that I don't find there, say, uh, good bed sheets for my guest house that I, I would have to bring. But I usually travel enough uh, to just bring stuff in my in my suitcase. And then for to send stuff to family, I use Amazon in France to send a present to a friend, for example. That works much better when you use the local stuff than trying to ship something from Guatemala and hope it arrives. Did you get good pillows down there? <laughs> uh not really <laughs> i could i could maybe hook you up i just i've got a friend uh and then jake's particular question pauline what do you think about that fractional shares are sending uh gifts of stock 
I've seen a couple of websites offer shares as a gift, but I'm I'm not sure whether the the kids, if they're minors, are they allowed to receive a share from a teacher? And if they'd have to open their own brokerage, it, it might be a little bit complicated, but that's an awesome gift to teach the kids to save, invest, and the value of an asset that increases in value. Jim, uh, mail in Panama? Mail in Panama? No, no. <laughs> you don't? <laughs> no, you- they... Uh, <laughs> no mail. Well, like like Pauline said, like one of our biggest eye openers here is they don't even have addresses here in Panama. You can get a P.O. box if you want to go to the Postal Service. But usually like mail takes like a month to get there if it gets there. And it's kind of crazy. But yeah, so we also have similar to what Pauline was saying. I mean, they you can uh, send things to like a an intermediary in, in Miami, and then they'll ship it to Panama. We actually have like a mailboxes, et cetera, here that we can pick stuff up at, but it can get expensive. So usually it's when you head back to the U S you stack up on your suitcase, give people gifts then, or, or whatever. But just to give you an example, Joe, like I needed to get some legal documents signed uh, and sent out to a company in the U S a couple months ago, and I wanted it to go as fast as possible And even mailboxes, et cetera, said the best they could do was five to seven business days at a cost of $45 for an envelope. And uh, I mean, it is what it is. But yeah, so it's not something something we do very often just for that reason. Yeah, that's crazy. But but, but you do have the same Amazon type system. Go to a box and pick it up. No, there's not one of those. But like I can you can send things. There's small little storefronts here. Gotcha. And so, so they'll, they'll issue you like a, a fake address in Miami, which is basically almost like a warehouse in Miami. And so Amazon will ship your product to this Miami warehouse with your little address. And then eventually it shows up about a, eh, a little less than a week later in, uh, in Boquete here. Someday. That's, that's crazy. And then any advice for Jake in particular on his stock? You know, I, Pauline brought up a, a good point about the uh, the age. I'm, I'm not sure with a minor if that's a, a big deal, but I did see on one website, I just uh, Googled a couple things here real quick, but uh, a friend of ours, you probably know him, Dough Roller, he actually has an article talking about uh, seven ways to gift stocks. And one of them is sending out fractional shares via uh, a company. I don't know if you want me to say the name of it. On no, here, go but, ahead. Uh, That's great. I, so I don't know their, how reputable it is, but Spark Gift, S-P-A-R-K-G-I-F-T, looks like looks like that's something it says. Uh, you could buy it for as little as $20 with a fee of two ninety five. dollars so plus the plus a little fee on the cost of the security, but that's not too bad. Yeah. We had the founder of Spark Gift on the show uh, talking about that. They got yeah. eaten up by Stockpile, which to my mind, Jake, is really the easiest one that I know. And it solves Pauline's problem immediately, which is the problem of whether they're a minor or not. So what happens is you give them the stock, they end up getting the gift, but they don't actually get the stock until they redeem it. And so then they sit down with a parent who helps them open the account and it's opened however it's best for them. So if you ever get stock from Stockpile, you want to redeem it right away. Because I gave my nephew's gift and my brother didn't do anything with it. And then I found out that, um, actually take that back. It was my brother. It was a family friend. But anyway, his dad didn't do anything with it. And uh, like a year later realized he'd never opened up the account and it was in Tesla and it had... (laughs) And it had gone straight up the entire year. And uh, even though it was a fractional share, I mean, I just gave him 50 bucks a Tesla. It would have been worth a lot, lot more. And but because he didn't claim it, that that's the problem. So, but Oops. yeah, Stockpile is, is the only company, Jake, that I know of. But I'll also link to Rob's piece. It probably is a, at least two years old, though. But we'll go ahead and link to it because Rob's one of the smartest guys I know. Rob Berger at, over at Dill Roller. Good stuff. How come you didn't mention us as the smartest people you know? You, you guys, I mean, a present company accepted. <laughs> yes. Fourth, Thanks, Joe. fourth smartest person I know. Right. <laughs> All right. Speaking of that, before I get myself in more trouble, let's get the hell out of here. That's going to do it for today. Let's talk about what's going on where you guys work and with the stuff that you're working on. Pauline, what are you doing over at Reach Financial Independence right now as we speak? Not much, because I recently got my work permits, and up until then, the IRS was considering blog writing as illegal. So 
I kind of took a little hiatus wow. to stay in compliance and I get kicked out of the country. That's and... probably good. Probably a good safety <laughs> tip. Yeah. Yeah. So my, my volunteering uh, with the Relief Society uh, has been where I've been dedicating my time and I'm studying to become a CFP. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. I assume then that uh, we will be seeing a lot more than I'm guessing by the way you're talking, there's going to be new stuff coming at uh, Reach Financial Independence? Hopefully. I'm thinking of doing consulting eventually and financial counseling, which I've come to appreciate a lot the offline work rather than being stuck with my screen all day. So maybe, maybe not. We'll see. Uh, a world- the weather is pretty nice and I like the beach. <laughs> You're in San Diego. Just holy cow. Yeah. It's, it's not, I would not want to be staring at a screen in San Diego. Likewise, in Panama, Jim, what's going on at Route to Retire, my friend? Well, let's start with this. I mean, next week we're going zip lining through the jungle. And then we're uh, super excited to have my in-laws visiting us next next month for a couple of weeks. They'll be our first visitors here. So we're actually counting down the days until they get here. I think that's not something a lot of people say about their in-laws, but we're very <laughs> excited for them to be here. And uh, yeah, other than that, still having fun writing on uh, Route to Retire. I write about personal finance, early retirement and traveling. And then, of course, we're we're busy enjoying everything Boquete Panama has to offer. Just your story about navigating COVID was... Uh was, I don't know if horrifying is the right word. <laughs> <laughs> Insane. <laughs> Insane. Yeah. Everybody's but it got, worked out. Everybody's got to check that out, especially as, yeah, just trying to, trying to, you're one of the people trying to get out of the country. Well, a lot of people trying to get out of the country, but you're trying to get out and get into Panama. They went into complete lockdown here and we could not even leave our even leave our condo with a couple exceptions, like to go to a grocery store on, like you'd be allotted like a certain hour of certain days to run to the grocery store. But, you know, not bad for uh, for a little bit. But after a couple months with a uh, 10 year old in, in the condo with you, it starts to get a little little old. <laughs> I can't I can't imagine. I love board games, but there's just not enough board games to keep me, <laughs> to keep me busy. Travis, the book is called The Fun Side of the Wall, Baby Boomer Retirement in Mexico. I'm assuming available everywhere. Uh, as far as I know, yeah, but um, uh, my preference would be to check it out on Amazon or go to funsidebook.com. And we've got some uh, other data that didn't end up in the book there if you'd like to look at some other um, infographics. What was the most surprising thing you found while writing the book? The most surprising thing I found while writing the book is how much more likely single women are to move to Mexico on their own than married couples or single men. Um, I found this really amazing group of adventurous baby boomer women who were ready for a next chapter in their life and just really bucked tradition, you know, conventional wisdom on, you know, doing adventurous things on their own. And um, they were a ton of fun to meet and interview and hang out with. That's awesome. We will link to not only the book, but also to Jim and Pauline sites on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. Guys, thanks a ton for being part of this special episode. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. That was fun. All right, Doug, uh, what should we have learned on today's show? So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our roundtable discussion. Retiring abroad is a much more feasible option than you'd think and can help your money to go further if you do some research. Second, take a lesson from our Friday FinTech segment. Technology can help you have better conversations with your kids about money and help them learn about modern money management. But the big lesson, don't talk in nonspecific terms with this audience. You all have dirty, dirty minds. To learn more about our guests and for more resources, you can head to our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Thanks to Jim White for joining us. You'll find Jim in Panama. So, you know, just like head down there and walk around a little while. You probably spot him. But it, it also, probably easier to just go to routetoretire.com. You'll find Travis Luther's book, The Fun Side of the Wall, wherever books are sold. And we'll share a link at our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Pauline Paquin's blog is reachfinancialindependence.com. You'll see her adventures in Guatemala all over her site. 
Thanks also to Benny Natchman from Jaspi for joining us. Head to jaspi.com, that's spelled J-A-S-S-B-Y.com, to check it out if you're looking for a resource to help teach your kids about money. This show is created by Joe Saul Seahide, produced by Karen Rapine, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm wondering if KY Jelly is actually made in Kentucky. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. Uh, For those of you that are new here, we don't talk about the after show. We have had people, we've said that to before, they've talked about it anyway, so we made an exception. You could talk about dessert online, but you can't talk about the after show. I have a story that I've talked about a lot where I insisted in the most annoyingly American way that I wanted port and the dude in in <laughs> the dude in France, by the way, Pauline, uh, was speaking to me in French. My daughter speaks French, mm-hmm. and I won't tell you the whole story, but he kept telling me over and over, we don't serve port. And I kept insisting that I wanted port in English. And the guy walks, the guy finally actually went to a store next door and bought me some damn port to shut me up. And my that's what my daughter said. <laughs> uh, that's what my daughter told me. She goes, I said, um, uh, I think he went next door to buy some. And Autumn said, that's exactly what he did, Dad. I said, what the hell are you talking about? And Autumn said, here's a conversation you were having. I'd like some port. We don't have any. Port. Porto. Yeah, sweet wine. We don't serve. <laughs> we don't serve that, sir. Port. Uh, Portugal. Port. We don't have any. And any, <laughs> anyway, the, I, I think that guy hated me, but I had no idea what he was talking about. So I'm wondering if in your trips abroad if you guys have had any similar uh things happen travis uh i would guess you might have a story yeah i mean i'm in my first solo trip to mexico you know all by myself i was very proud of myself i hacked out a bunch of spanish i got around just fine and i went to this restaurant this outdoor patio restaurant and i'm a vegetarian and so you know i have to always negotiate the menu which is kind of hard those are the things you don't really go over in spanish class And so I I thought I'm doing a great job. I told the guy I'm a vegetarian. I saw that they had like this mushroom taco, this poblano taco, and then also like this, this fajita veggie taco. And I told him what I thought I told him was, I want the taco platter, but can I just get one of each of the veggie tacos instead of having to get, you know, three of one kind. And he, he kind of like looked at me funny. And I said, I kept telling him I'm vegetarian, I'm vegetarian. And then I also wanted to get a side of rice and beans for each one too. And so he finally nods and he leaves and he comes back and he puts three platters, like three full <laughs> meals down. That's three sides of rice, three sides of beans. <laughs> so apparently I wanted one of every, what he was trying to tell me was that was too much food. And I was trying to tell him <laughs> you know, what I was saying. Uh, so anyway, suffice to say I had a couple boxes on to take home. With me. <laughs> this American, this American can eat. That's right. <laughs> yes. Uh, Pauline in your travels, any uh, big miscommunication? 
Yeah, I had liver for breakfast because the the word for liver in Arabic is very close to butter. So I thought I was being served something buttery and delicious, like a croissant. <laughs> and I I was staying with a family, and it's I cannot waste food, so that, that was a bit hard to swallow, literally. <laughs> You're like, ooh, butter, ooh, livery. Sounds great for me. <laughs> Jim, how about you, man? I, You know, I was thinking about it. My wife is going to kill me because I actually had a great story and I can't remember the punchline. We were in we were in Jamaica and we were in a limo. We had got it was the same cost as a cab to go somewhere. And uh, I can't remember what I had said, but I, I had misunderstood completely what this guy was saying. and. Joe, I'm just blowing the whole thing because I can't, I can't remember it. It was the funniest thing and I just ruined everything. You had to be, you had to be there. Yeah. Great story, Jim. Yeah. yeah. I'm great with those. Great at stories. (laughs) Some of the most talented people in Hollywood like to really open up and get inside of you with Michael Rosenbaum. Zach Levi. We're about to shoot this movie, American Underdog, which is the Kurt Warner football quarterback biopic. Right, you're Kurt Warner. Yeah. Can you throw a football? I can throw a football pretty well. I mean, I don't know that I throw as good as Kurt Warner. (laughs) Jeez Louise. You know, when you throw that good, you play in the NFL. Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Get it on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your shows.